This episode contains graphic descriptions of crime scenes, which may be disturbing to some listeners. Today we're bringing you the story of a 14-year-old girl who was dropped off at school and then mysteriously disappeared. After 40 years, police are still looking for answers. Can they be found hidden somewhere in the family secrets? This is APB Cold Case. Here's your host, former police chief, Mark Spahn. The morning of March 7, 1983, was cool and rainy in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. 14-year-old Tracy Bird woke up in the house she shared with her mom, her mom's boyfriend Paul, and her two older brothers, 16-year-old Dale and 18-year-old Frank. The petite, blue-eyed teenager was going through the typical and sometimes difficult transition from childhood into young adulthood. She really wanted to fit in with her peers, so she often copied the latest fashion trend as she got dressed for school. Here's Tracy's brother Dale talking about her sense of style. Fully accessorized, but like uh, feathers in her hair and, you know, that kind of stuff with the feather earring and all that stuff that they were doing back then. (laughs) She was trying to be in the in crowd, you know. Even though she was running a little late that morning, it appeared to be just another normal day. But actually, Tracy had a secret. Maybe more than one. On that particular day, Tracy was dropped off at Ben Salem High School, which was less than a mile from home, by her mother's boyfriend, Paul. I spoke with Tracy's brother, Dale, about that morning. I slept on the sofa. I remember Paul saying, you're going to be late to Tracy. She was upstairs. Let's go, let's go. And out the door they went. Next thing I knew, Paul was coming back in the room, into the into the house, and it's pouring outside. So that, you think nothing of it, you know. You know, at that point, you plop your head back down, you go back to sleep. Tracy didn't come straight home from school that afternoon, which wasn't totally out of character for her. So, at first, her family thought she may be with friends. But as darkness fell and the evening progressed, still no Tracy. Again, here's Tracy's brother, Dale. Well, she never came home. I mean, it had to be the next day that Mom called the school to find and found out that she was suspended and wasn't even supposed to be there. Tracy's mother, Jean, reported her daughter missing, and police began an investigation. According to the family, Tracy was a normal teenager. It appeared that she had a good relationship with her family, especially her mom. Jean's boyfriend, Paul, was also questioned as he was the one that claimed to have dropped her off at school that morning. When asked, he denied any knowledge of her disappearance. As Tracy's brother mentioned earlier, Tracy had actually been suspended from school, and according to authorities, she was not allowed to attend classes until there was a sit-down meeting between school staff and her mother. And we don't know why, but she was hiding that fact from her mom for at least a couple of days. We were unable to find any information on the reason for her suspension or where she'd been going during the previous days that she hadn't been in school. Investigators questioned teachers, friends, and classmates, as well as neighbors in the area, but there were no solid leads. Some thought that Tracy may have run away. She had done that once before. And according to published reports, there were rumors circulating that Tracy was pregnant. We spoke with Danae Beauchelle, a friend and classmate of Tracy's. She told us that the weekend before she disappeared, Tracy had confided in her. She didn't get her period, and that's how she knew. She had been about a month pregnant, and she was a little girl. In the days and weeks that followed her disappearance, Tracy's mother made a public appeal, hoping that Tracy would hear her message. Just come home. But no new lead surfaced, only an occasional sighting which never resulted in any substantial information leading to Tracy's whereabouts. In school, Tracy sat behind her friend in a Beauchelle in first period algebra class. She told us that she thinks about Tracy often. He was a good friend and a good confidant. He was a sweet kid and I, I, I do, I miss her. She was a good friend. It really was. Tracy's brother Dale also shared some memories of his sister. She was going to Ben Salem High School in her first year. I mean, she loved music. 
she loved dancing. <laughs> she loved the movie Grease. And <laughs> she was a bright light. She was an amazing young lady. One morning on a rainy day, she went to school and never came home. Some of the investigative leads that police would explore today weren't available in the early 1980s. There were no smartphones, no tracking her movements through cell phone towers, and there were fewer surveillance cameras than we know today. Weeks turned into months, and still no sign of Tracy, who would have turned 15 during the summer of 1983. The lack of movement in the case was stressful on the family, and there was added tension at home. At the time of Tracy's disappearance, her mom, Jean, had been seeing Paul Greenwald for about five years. And there's quite a backstory here. Here's Tracy's brother, Dale. They were together since 77, since my mom and dad's divorce. In fact, Paul was my dad's friend. And we had horses, but my dad caught them in the stables. That's what prompted the divorce. Dale told me that Paul was abusive toward his mom. Paul was hitting her. We knew it. We'd actually sit around, me and Frankie would sit around with baseball bats waiting for him to, you know, to slip up. But she'd hide in a, in a room for days. And to really understand the dynamics of their relationship, we need to go back even further. Back to November of 1980. Three years before Tracy's disappearance, Gene Bird had broken up with Paul Greenwald. But Paul wasn't one to let go easy. He reportedly forced his way into Gene's apartment where she was with another man. News reports say that Greenwald stabbed the man and fled with Gene. Gene's son, Dale, shares some of those details. He kidnapped her, drug her down three flights of steps, stabbed the boyfriend in the hand, snatched her, and proceeded to drive through 20 Middletown Township and Trenton police officers. In that incident, Greenwald allegedly took police on a 12-mile chase that ended with him crashing into a tree. After being treated for his injuries, he was charged with felonious restraint, burglary, assault, and other charges. Ironically, it was Gene Bird who testified in defense of Greenwald at his sentencing for the burglary and abduction charges. It's not uncommon in domestic violence cases that the victim becomes protective of their abuser. Victims might feel intimidated by them, or reliant on them for financial support, or they may be hopeful in assurances that he'll stop the violence. According to the Doylestown Intelligence or newspaper, the deputy district attorney asked the judge to sentence Greenwald to jail, but instead, the court gave him probation. The DA indicated that decision was most likely influenced by Gene Bird's testimony. She let him back. My mom just made some very ridiculous choices sometimes. The first one, of course, was bringing, bringing him back into our lives. No doubt, letting Paul back into their lives back then was a bad decision. But was it a fateful one as well? The stress and grief caused by Tracy's disappearance took a huge toll on Jean's already tumultuous relationship with Paul. It got to the point where they weren't paying their rent, so the two split up again. Jean and her son Dale moved in with a friend at the Country Commons Apartments. Her older son stayed with one of his buddies. They were away from Paul, but still concerned how he'd react to another breakup. Only time would tell. It's now been seven months since Tracy's disappearance. The investigation has not produced any strong leads. The case has gone cold. But then, in the fall of that year, something shocking happens. On October 7th of 1983, Jean Bird, dressed in blue jeans and a white sweater, told her son that she was going out, and she left the apartment heading for the parking lot where her Ford Pinto station wagon was parked. When she didn't return home by the next day, her family reported her missing. It was not normal for her to go off for any length of time without letting someone know. Police questioned neighbors, but there were no reports of a scuffle, fight, or anything suspicious in the area. Her car was still sitting in the parking lot, and it was eventually processed for any evidence in her disappearance, but nothing was found. Police believe she was being stalked and that she'd been abducted before she ever got to her car. I asked Dale if his mom knew that she was being watched by Paul Greenwald at the time. Oh, we know. Me and I both know. So did the lady who was allowing us to stay at her apartment. They were friends, and that's what she needed, somebody that was removed from her life so she could go over there and be away from him, but it didn't happen. 
Dale told me that Paul, the man he used to call Dad, had serious jealousy issues. He refused to let go and would often become enraged. Paul would stalk my mom. He parked the um, green station wagon across the street at the church, hide it behind some, some high hedges, and just sit there and watch the house all day from 11 in the morning till the lights went down at night. Jean had moved away from Paul, but not far enough. He'd been watching her every move. Dale talks about the last time he saw Paul. I had looked over at the freaking car sitting there at the church, and he's just doing what he had done for the last week, just sits there, sits there, staring at the damn door, waiting for her to go out. And she had a date that night. She went out. She never came back. And I never saw him again. Did Paul abduct Jean again? If so, she was no match for him. She was small-framed, petite. Paul was much stronger than she was, and he was capable of violence, especially when angry. He was a shorter fellow in stature, but he was as strong as an ox. He's a roofer who slung a hot mop all the time. Police were aware of Paul Greenwald's history of violence when he'd previously abducted Jean and stabbed a man she was with back in 1980. So it's quite possible that police were looking at Paul as a potential suspect, or at least a person of interest. The investigation into Jean's disappearance continued, and about 10 days later, police caught a break in the case, although not a happy one. On October 18, 1983, a couple photographers were hiking in Blackbird State Forest in Delaware when they came upon a decomposing body. They immediately reported it to authorities. To give you some perspective on the location, Blackbird is a 5,000-acre state forest located about 45 minutes south of Wilmington, and it has over 45 miles of hiking and horse trails. Delaware police officers arrived on scene and note that the body had been buried in a shallow grave in a wooded area just off a dirt track in what appeared to be a designated campground. The victim's head had been bound with duct tape, and the body was partially clothed. The state of decomposition made an identification even more problematic. The body was taken to the morgue and a physical description was sent over the police teletype to agencies across the eastern seaboard. Later that same evening, Ben Salem detectives investigating Jean's disappearance reached out to Delaware authorities. They thought this could be Jean Bird. The medical examiner determined that the victim was a female in her early to mid-30s. The cause of death was asphyxiation and the manner of death was ruled a homicide. The physical description matched Jean, including some scars and a small butterfly tattoo. But the identification was ultimately confirmed by dental records. The victim was Jean Bird. It was reported that when the body was found, she was wearing the same white sweater and jewelry she had on when she left her apartment. Delaware State Police were now investigating Jean Bird's murder and not just her disappearance. And at the same time, Ben Salem, Pennsylvania police continued their investigation into Tracy's disappearance. Are the cases connected? How did Paul Greenwald figure into all of this? He was questioned by Delaware State Police, but he admitted to nothing. It shouldn't be a surprise, but when I spoke with Dale, he told me that Blackbird State Forest, where his mother's body was found, was familiar to him. It was a memory he had of a couple of camping trips, something that they had all done together as a family. Yeah, it was fun. We sit around a fire and do the, the normal things families do, you know? Trying to be normal. During their investigation, authorities took Dale to Blackbird State Forest so he could identify any familiar areas. According to Dale, he led them to their old campsite, which was just yards from where his mother's body had been found. The most obvious suspect is Paul Greenwald. He had a violent past, especially with Jean and he was familiar with the location where her body was found. But police couldn't arrest him on a hunch. They had to let the evidence tell the story. They had to build their case. Finally, in November of 1984, about one year after Jean Bird's body was found, and about a year and a half after 14-year-old Tracy went missing, Jean Bird's former boyfriend, 38-year-old Paul Greenwald, is arrested by Delaware State Police for Jean's murder. We don't have details of his interrogation, but reports indicate that he ultimately admitted to suffocating Jean, who was found with duct tape wrapped around her mouth and face. And just as his trial was about to begin, 
Greenwald took a plea to manslaughter. But then, one week before he was to be sentenced, on March 20th, 1986, Paul Greenwald committed suicide by overdose at the Gander Hill Prison in Wilmington, Delaware. It was reported that Greenwald had stockpiled his antidepressant pills and took all of them on the day he was to be sentenced. This was certainly a blow to Tracy's investigation. Greenwald had been previously questioned about Tracy's disappearance. He always maintained that she was alive and well when he dropped her off at school, and he never admitted any wrongdoing or knowledge of her whereabouts. So, Jean's murder is solved, and her killer is dead. But what about Tracy? Ben Salem police had conducted numerous interviews and followed up on all possible leads, but there was still no sign of the missing 14-year-old. With no new information, the investigation into Tracy Bird's disappearance went cold. Years pass with no movement on the case. But in 2002, Ben Salem PD detective Chris McMullen, while recovering from an injury, is assigned to light duty. He's still working on his other cases, but he's handed a couple of old files, one of which was Tracy Bird. He starts working the case. It was then 19 years since Tracy disappeared, so he has to go back to the beginning. Chris McMullen is now a lieutenant with the Bucks County Sheriff's Office. I asked him to take us back to the days leading up to Tracy's disappearance, and if he had any thoughts as to where Tracy had been hiding when she was supposed to be in school. I mean, I can only assume that she was laying low at a friend's house if maybe somebody else was cutting, or she must have had some place to go. I would think, especially back in those days, if she had been walking around the streets, she would have been picked up for truancy. Almost two decades had passed, so I asked if he was able to re-interview any original witnesses. I have met with the brothers on a couple occasions, and they were really my only source of direct information from the family. I had spoken to other friends of hers. I met with her grandmother, her maternal grandmother. It appeared to me that, you know, Tracy had a good relationship with her mother. I have no reason to say otherwise. I also asked him about the exes in Jean's life. There was exes questioned about both Tracy and then later on Jean's disappearance. And I, I know that Mr. Bird, the, the father of Dale and Frank, when I, when I was diving into this investigation, I wanted to get familial DNA from all of them. So I got it from the two brothers and I got it from uh, the maternal grandmother. And then I went to see Mr. Bird, who at the time was living in New Jersey. And he was very honest with me. He said he didn't know if he was the father of Tracy. With his consent, I took his DNA anyway, just to be safe. Years later, I did find the other individual who I thought may have been her father at the time was living in Florida but I arranged for the locals down there to collect his DNA as well and put it into CODIS. I was just trying to cover all the bases that I could, hoping that maybe at some point we get a CODIS hit on an unidentified. Has, hasn't happened yet. With fresh eyes on the case, McMullen comes across a new lead from an old Jane Doe file. Back in January 1988, something strange had been discovered at an abandoned distillery along the Delaware River about a mile from Tracy's home. A couple was walking their dog and looked down into an old well. It was concrete, rising a couple feet above the ground, with an iron ladder extending into the well. As they looked down, they saw a skeleton. And then they called police. The intact remains were recovered and taken to the medical examiner's office. An anthropologist said this was a young white female, about 17 to 23 years old. And they recovered fetal bones. This Jane Doe had been pregnant. The medical examiner estimated she'd been in the well for three to five years. Tracy went missing in 1983, and the physical similarities were there, especially considering the rumor that Tracy might have been pregnant. Did they just find Tracy Bird? Here's Detective Chris McMullen. There was a rumor that I had read in, in the original reports that, you know, Tracy may have been pregnant, but I, I, you know, and obviously I always wanted to try and find out, well, any friends that I had ever spoken to, they... I was hoping for somebody to say, well, yeah, it was him. This is this is who she was involved with. But th that never happened. Now, whether it was because people did, truly didn't know or they just they weren't telling me, you know, not wanting to rat somebody out, whatever. But I mean, she had disappeared, I believe, in the spring of 83. And I didn't start opening cold cases until 2002. So there had been quite a head start. It was tough just just finding people. This Jane Doe was an exciting lead for McMullen and for the family. The autopsy results were beginning to line up with Tracy Bird. DNA was extracted from the bones, and they waited patiently for the results to come back. 
Again, here's Chris McMullen. Everything on that fit. The body was about, give or take, a mile from where Tracy lived. According to the anthropologist, it was a white female, age 17 to 23. All right, so Tracy was, I think, 14, but I was always given room for a little bit of error there. And that Jane Doe was pregnant. And even if you look at the, the sculpture, the forensic sculpture that was done by Frank Bender, there was a, it could have been a resemblance to Tracy, I mean, in, in the face and whatnot. I remember when um, I had requested CODIS do a direct comparison between the family reference samples between her brothers and alleged fathers and, and maternal grandmother. I would have bet my next check back then that I was going to get a hit. But shockingly, the skeleton recovered from the abandoned well was not Tracy Bird. It turned out to be Lisa Todd, another missing teenager who you'll hear about in a future episode. We really wanted to know why this Jane Doe was not compared to Tracy back in 1988, but we were unable to find an answer to that question. And while the identification of this Jane Doe brings some closure to another family, Tracy is still missing. Chris McMullen and I spoke about possible theories for Tracy's disappearance. I asked him if he thought Paul Greenwald was involved. By the time I came along, in my opinion, circumstantially, he was my guy. I, I know that he was questioned about it previously, but you know, I, I was not there. So I, I can't say how focused they were on him or how adamant they were, how hard they went at him. All I know is that he never made any admissions and obviously they weren't able to have evidence to put it on him. My theory always was, you know, this guy allegedly drove her to school that day, but I was told, well, she never attended school that day. In fact, she wasn't supposed to be in school. And, you know, she was never seen again. In the meantime, you know, obviously she was missing. I know there was at least one newspaper article with Jean holding a portrait of, of Tracy and pleading for her daughter's return. No more than six months later, she's murdered by Paul. And I always thought, well, she probably said to him, you know, what did you do to my daughter? You know, I mean, that's what I think. I, I don't know this. I, I haven't been able to prove it, but it just seemed to me that she probably kept saying, well, you saw her last, you saw her last. We know how it ended with him and her. As you've heard, Detective McMullen has given serious thought to Paul Greenwald's potential involvement in Tracy's disappearance. After all, there's a violent history there. Kidnapping, assault, stabbing another boyfriend, and Greenwald's stalking of Jean. The original detectives may have felt the same, because reports indicate that Blackbird State Forest was searched for Tracy's body shortly after Jean's body was discovered there. No evidence in Tracy's case was found at that time. I asked Tracy's brother Dale if he suspected Paul Greenwald had anything to do with Tracy's disappearance. He said he thought it could be someone other than Paul. I also asked him if he thought there was any inappropriate conduct between Paul and Tracy. As far as I know, no. As far as I know, he made no sexual advances to Tracy. He might have. Another possible theory for Tracy's disappearance involves the pregnancy rumor. Here's Chris McMullen. If she indeed was pregnant, whoever was the father of that child, I believe Tracy was 14 at the time. The father was if he was older. If he, if he was an adult, he may have been worried about a statutory rape accusation. If he was her age, he, he was scared to be a teen parent. Who knows? I mean, there's always the theory that the father of her child may have attacked her and, and killed her as well. They're the two theories that I've always had. It's just not much to go on. It seems unlikely that Tracy is a runaway. It's more likely that something happened to her and that someone is responsible for her disappearance. While investigators are thankful they were able to solve the identity of the Jane Doe found in the well, they definitely have not forgotten about Tracy Bird. Where could she be? Is she close to home? Is she somewhere in Blackbird State Forest where Greenwald buried her mother? They're not giving up, and the case remains open for Ben Salem Police. Here's Tracy's brother. I mean, there's still no answers after 40 years. You know, 40 years is a long time, dude. I've had seven heart attacks. I'm in congestive heart failure. I don't have much time left. And I'd like to see this done before I go. I keep her picture right here, and I never stop thinking about her. At least once a day, every day, I think about her. Detective McMullen told me that he had success in working some other cold cases and was truly hoping that he could find out what happened to Tracy. 
Yeah, it, it, it bothers me. I mean, I, I I had some luck with a few cold cases there, and I was really hoping that I could find out what happened to Tracy, but it just, despite our best efforts, we still haven't been able to locate her. The DNA that is in the CODA system, the family reference samples, that's, they're still there, but there was a lot of you know, eliminations of unidentified Jane Doe decedents not being Tracy Bird. So it's, it's still a mystery. As far as persons of interest go, Paul Greenwald is certainly someone to be looked at. The circumstances of him being the last person to have reportedly seen Tracy, his violent history, and killing Jean just months after Tracy disappears. But who else could have a motive? Could it be someone who wanted to silence Tracy about an unwanted pregnancy? Or is it someone else altogether? Detective McMullen has since retired from Ben Salem PD and now serves as a lieutenant with the Bucks County, Pennsylvania Sheriff's Office. He still has the passion for working cold cases. He and retired Pennsylvania State Trooper Tom McAndrew have started a nonprofit organization called the Cold Case Initiative. Their mission is to provide assistance to law enforcement agencies to bring the latest technology to help resolve murders and missing persons cases. The Tracy Bird case is still an open investigation. She's not been forgotten by her family or by police. Hopefully someone out there has a piece of the puzzle that will help to solve this mystery. If you have any information about the disappearance of Tracy Bird, call Ben Salem Detectives at 215-633-3719. For photos, timeline, and a who's who for this episode, and for more information on the Cold Case Initiative, check out our show notes at apbcoldcase.com. Thanks for listening to APB Cold Case. Tell us about your cold case at apbcoldcase at spawngroup.com.